Okay. on Terry right now. Molly was there for a few seconds. Um, I am logging into YouTube. Okay, we got it going. We'll okay, uh, going now. Yeah, okay, go ahead, Alex. Hi, everybody. This is Alex. Welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. We've had some technical difficulties. Apparently, uh, we're not coming in from Australia as well as we should be tonight. Um, Molly stepped in and um, I think she's got it going. Hope so. Um, welcome back to the Astro Imaging Channel. I hope everybody had a good Mother's Day. Even if you're not a mother, it's nice to have a good Mother's Day because we, we've all had mothers at one point or another. So um, welcome back. Tonight, Brandon is going to take us on a really interesting tour. He's going to take us uh, something that I'm interested in seeing because I have fallen uh, I have followed for the real short, wide field type telescope. Um, and in particular, I wanna, I've got a Samyang, um, uh, a Sammy 135, and I think that's going to be one of the things he talks about tonight. So I'm, I'm interested in seeing that. Before we go there, though, uh, let's see if I've, uh, yeah, there, um, would somebody confirm for me that we are now showing my screen? And yeah. we should be on the Astro Imaging channel. Okay. I did some work this morning on the um, web pages. So if you go to our home page, you will see that we have another TAIC user shots program coming up. This one's called the Heart of the Galaxy. We want you to go on out there and take a picture of the heart of the Milky Way, someplace in there, someplace near the center of the Milky Way. We couldn't decide where the center of the Milky Way is. So we just decided that we'd say ah, something like 20 degrees within, you know, 20 degrees or so. Um, let me get back over here for a second and stop sharing. Um, now, we're not exactly going to be real specific about what is 20 degrees or not 20 degrees, because frankly, it'd be too much work. But this is an early form of, of plate solving. OK, you'd get one of these things and you see right there, it says center of the, the galaxy right there on the on the planisphere. And we figured that on this particular. You got about two inches, get about two inches within there. OK, now, what does that give you? That gives you things like, oh, a lot of M objects. Um, M4 would probably qualify and 14, 10, 12. Uh, 17, I think, is in there. 16 is in there. Uh, M8, M20. Um, there's a whole lot of stuff that you can take pictures of. And there's all those globulars along the southern rim. And for those of you in the southern hemisphere who can pick it up even, there's some other things you can pick up. So please uh, enjoy yourself going out there and uh, take some pictures of the um, some fascinating objects in the center of the Milky Way. It's summertime and uh, that's or wintertime if you're down south. And that's the best time to be seeing these things. So please take advantage of uh, the TAIC shots. What we'll do is we'll put it together in a movie. We've got the solar system movie here and we have Neo Wison Parade, Orion Time, Gorgeous Galaxies, Nebula, the Nebulae, the Beauty of Dust. These are all pictures. These are all collections that we've done before using your work. And we really appreciate you participating in this. Remember, um, there's a lot of stuff that goes on on the Astro Imaging Channel. And it's important that we have as many people participating in this as we can. So get your picture of the heart of the galaxy into us by September 11th. And uh, then we'll put you to, on, in a movie. Arna will do some work and get you on for September 25th. 
Um, make your picture big enough so that we can actually see it. it. And it doesn't need to be much bigger than that. I mean, after all, uh, much bigger than about 1080 on a side, because it's going to go into a movie whose resolution is not all that much bigger than that. So you don't have to worry about sending us a great big XISF file from PixInsight or anything else like that. Just send us a real, you know, the best shot that you can get 1080 at least on one side. Now, there's another uh, set of things I was doing on the workshop this morning, uh, on the web page this morning. Um, every so often we have workshops and it's always amazing to see that, you know, like this is all one set of data. This is all one collection that uh, I think this is Eric, M33, I think, but I forget. Um, and uh, people have all their own interpretations of what that data should look like. Well, here's another chance for you to put that together. This time, um, I put in one of Eric's images here. It's a California nebula. This is a monochrome image just because I liked the monochrome image. I liked all of Eric's work, but I put this one in. Uh, and then um, same same thing as before. Um, Eric donated his, his da data, and we put it up on the web. It's a California nebula, uh, California nebula obviously. And you guys can take until August 14th to do whatever you can do with this data. You've got the narrowband data and you've got the RG and B data. So please go ahead and do that. Um, you've got both XISF and um, um, FITS files for the, or TIFF files for this. So everybody should be able to do this kind of stuff. Um, and then we're... As you send them in to us, Rory, who's in charge of this operation, will uh, be reviewing them and maybe contacting a few of you to come help us present this at a show on August 28th. Uh, again, submit at least 1080 on each side so we can check things like that. And this button right here gets you the data, and this other button submits the data back to us, okay? Now, for those of you who want to practice with other data sets, all of our old uh, workshops, well, most of our old workshops are already here and the data is still available. You can click right here and you can go back to the data. Um, one other thing I wanna show you on the website, as I do every week, is I wanna preview what's happening next week. Jose is gonna be coming in next week and he's gonna be telling us about um, a program that he did with uh, a large Magellanic cloud. Uh, he engineered it, he organized it, and he's going to tell us what he learned about taking this uh, and producing this, this, this image of the large Magellanic cloud. The week after that, we have to take a day off because we're going to be traveling back from the Advanced Imaging Conference. You've heard about the Advanced Imaging Conference before. We strongly suggest all of you take advantage of it. Um, it's up in San Jose. Go to Advanced Imaging Conference. Um, and Google their website, and you, you, I, I believe you can still register for it and stuff like that. And then we come back. Um, we are taking another break on the 4th of July, and then after that, we've got some open schedules, and that's not good. We, we, we'd hope that you can help us fill those open schedules uh, by coming up to the contact here and tell us who you are, what you do, uh, what you'd like to talk to us about, and we'll check you out, ask you a few questions, and uh, get you to participate by showing some stuff, but like Brandon's showing us tonight. So enough of me. Let's me stop sharing and get back to Brandon. And uh, Brandon, tell us what you know about uh, wide field imaging. Happy to, Alex. So, Thank you. I didn't have a Sam Young. I have a Rokinon. 135, which is basically the same thing as the Samyang. So we'll spend some time talking about that tonight. So when I set out to do this presentation, one of the things I wanted to do is look at what we have in the database for the Astro Imaging Channel and see what hasn't been covered or not covered directly. And when I did that, I decided short focal length astrophotography and especially portable um, astrophotography was a good place to kind of talk about as we get into the Milky Way season. With that coming up here in the next several months, um, looking at different focal lengths from 135 millimeters to 400 millimeters and then portable and then less portable setups. So 
Um, I will kind of have an open presentation style tonight. So if there's questions, please jump in. I'm going to be going through kind of a wide variety of things and then I'm happy to answer as questions come up. So first, just a special thanks um, first to my wife on Mother's Day. She puts up with my hobby and she's been very supportive of the whole process, including lots of pictures um, at our work, um, at home, and um, just is very encouraging for me when I'm spending time doing this. Also for my mom, who's in this picture, um, she's the one with my dad who got my first telescope three and a half years ago, and it's been a fun journey since then. Also, I wanted to say just a special like thanks for several of these names listed, fellow astrophotographers. These gentlemen in particular have responded on emails or phone calls um, or live chats that have helped me really refine my process and make decisions on equipment going forward. So I am indebted to those and many others within the hobby. So thank you. Um, basic contact info here, just where I'm on Astrobin Instagram and Cloudy Nights. If you want to reach out to me, please send me a message and I'll try to get back to you as soon as I'm able. A uh, little bit about my background, I'll keep it short as it's not changed much since last year when I presented about the Raza 8. Uh, my undergrad is in biochemistry and cognitive psychology and I currently work as a full spectrum family physician here in Northeast Kansas. Um, I have three kids and stay pretty busy with lots of activities, um, both with the kids um, and just different hobbies and just pretty active generally. And the nighttime hours are spent me doing this while the rest of my family sleeps. So first question I wanted to ask is why short focal length astrophotography? Um, part of it is I started with a long focal length an edge nine and a quarter and had intentions of using it both for planetary as well as attaching um, a lens unit so that I could do fast star. Well, as I've continued to go on the hobby, I still really enjoy my edge nine and a quarter, but I really enjoyed doing wide field, kind of like Alex was saying. It gives you a chance to do a lot of neat things with it. Um, and it's a little easier and more forgiving. So first of all, it's easier. Your polar alignment doesn't have to be as accurate. Your mount tracking doesn't have to be as precise. Your guiding can be a little looser than what you would need to do at a focal length of 1600 versus 135 millimeters. Also, it's just cheaper. Um, the equipment, the mounts, the guides, the guide scopes, um, all of it's just fairly inexpensive compared to higher focal length in general. Uh, also, I can take this anywhere. My goal was to be able to easily pack up my equipment for both kind of wide field with the 135, but even at 280 versus 400 to be able to take the scope off all connected and then take the mount and um, put the tripod in the car and go to dark sites. I thankfully live in Bortle class four, but I can drive two hours or excuse me, an hour and get to Bortle class two. So that's something as I do camping and other things as the kids get older, I want something that's very portable, easy to move around and transport. The other thing I really enjoy is using um, multiple framing of objects. You can really portray different things based on what's in your image and what you want to emphasize and how you want to orient it compared to other objects. And it gives you a really sense or a sense of space and location, uh, especially within the heart of the Milky Way. Additionally to that, it's easier to do. I live where it's pretty windy. So a large focal length with a large cross-sectional diameter on a scope, the wind really affects my imaging versus there's not a huge cross-sectional area on a camera lens. And that just makes it a lot easier to do, especially when the conditions aren't exceptionally good. The other thing is even when the scene's bad here, I average somewhere between three and four and a half arc seconds. Um, when it's worse, I just throw out one of my wider focal length. And while I don't have the resolution, I'm not really losing anything and I'm still capturing data on those nights. So that's a general look at that. For me, my requirements is I want something I could grab and go. Literally, I could set up my big mount and then I could pick up another mount that already had a telescope, plop it down, polar align it, and have my imaging going within 15 minutes. And all of the um, imaging that I do with the 135 and the ASCAR 400, I can do within about 15 to 20 minutes, which really makes things exciting because I'm getting data at a longer focal length, but I'm also capturing wide angle data. 
The other thing is I wanted it to be automated. I wanted to have electronic focusing, plate solving, and I wanted to be able to do it using an extension cord or using um, a mobile battery situation. For me, that's the less, the less drawn power tank, um, but there's a lot of better batteries out there, but it can run all night for me when I'm using it, just even in the yard, depending on what angle I'm trying to capture. So with that, here are my three different rigs. Um, and I brought in the Rasa as a placeholder at 400 uh, millimeter focal length, but also to show that it's still a pretty wide angle compared to a lot of resolution or a lot of different telescopes as far as its imaging depth. Next, you have the ASCAR, um, which is normally a focal length of 400, so it compares to the same framing as the Rasa, but I have it reduced with a focal reducer of 0.7. So it's down at 280 millimeter focal length. And then I have the Rokinon 135. And I'll go into a lot of different details, but as you can see, here's my larger mount that I run my edge nine and a quarter and my Rasa on usually, but how much smaller, and I can literally pick up this entire mount. And I can easily pick up this mount um, with the 135 and we'll get into all the details going forward. My favorite part, and I think this is probably what Alex was alluding to, is just the framing that you can encounter using um, wide field. So here is my version of the Siegel Nebula. Um, I, this is with the 135 millimeter. I had no idea. I knew that Thor's helmet was going to be in the corner, so I wanted to frame it with the Siegel Nebula and also this globular cluster out here. I had no idea until I started having subs roll in that there were these extra rings and bow shock patterns that were extending out. So it really gives you a chance to find extra um, dust and nebulosity that you just didn't know was there. Um, and it really provides an interesting um, portrayal of different targets. Um, so here's that 135 over here. And then here's at the 280 focal length with the Ascar. So zoomed in, but you can start to see those faint hints now this is in a one-shot color that's um, added with hydrogen alpha data versus this is a narrow band completely. Versus, Brandon? Yes, sir. I don't think we see your pointer. I'm not sure why, uh, but can you just describe which picture you're referring to? It might oh, be obvious, but we're not seeing yep. your pointer. Um, so the far left image um, is the wide 135. It's the green and yellow version. Um, I am trying to get my pointer. Arrow options. I'm in the arrow options there. It's showing up now. Yes. Okay. I apologize for that. So Siegel Nebula, this is in one shot color with addition of the hydrogen alpha at 280. So you can still see that nebulosity, um, but not as long of um, sub exposures. Versus over here, the orange and blue one is an early one of with my Rasa 8 um, that wasn't really focused well. Um, but you can just see the difference um, in the framing across those three that we'll talk about tonight. But here I had my nine and quarter, what I did with Thor's helmet. So if you see Thor's helmet in the top right, that's what's existing. So you just get such a an expansive um, portrayal of what's going around different objects. And I think it's fun to group those. Um, and a lot of that is done by looking at different planetarium softwares like Stellarium or Telescopius, or I use Nina for my edge setup um, and seeing what it's out there, what nebulosity is out there, what do I want to frame in, what do I want to focus on, and what do I want to grab attention in the corners. So next, I just wanted to show how I use Stellarium. Um, I think Stellarium is good for a couple things when you're looking at um, framing things, but it's also good when comparing different types of new equipment. So here is, if you look here is the framing using my 294 MC or MM. So I've punched in the width of the chip and the pixel size into Stellarium up here over in the settings bar. And then it projects this framing based on um, what focal length I have. So I have the Rasa 8, it's at a focal length of 400. So you can see where I'm located um, on the RA and deck. You can see how many degrees um, and horizontal and vertical. And then you can actually see it's calculating a, a, an approximate pixel scale. So I know that to have a good image, I need to probably be in scene conditions under double what that pixel scale is. Ideally, would like to have scene conditions closer to that, but that's not always guaranteed. 
The other thing is you can look at different targets at different times and then able to say, what orientation do I want? So if you look over here, orientation's set at zero. And then if I wanted to change it, so I have a vertical com composition, then I can pull in the star cluster as well as the trifid and the lagoon. So Stellarium or any other planetarium software is good because then you can start plugging in different cameras and different focal lengths and seeing which objects that you really like. Will it capture those um, portraits that you want to be able to create and display going forward? So here's an example of just comparison. So this is the 400 meter millimeter focal length. And then here is the same one, but going to the 280 millimeter focal length. And you can see I have the ASCAR 400 over here. I have it set to 280 at baseline. So it's capturing all this nebulosity as well as that cluster and the trifid compared to the PASA 8. And then for the Rokinon 135, I switched the orientation to 90 degrees. And then you can see that I have all of those previous things, but I've also added um, the Sagittarius star cloud up here at M24. So you can really create a neat portrayal of the center of the galaxy. And this may be something I'll try to add to um, the upcoming show. Who knows? We'll see how the weather goes. So the Rokinon 135 millimeter lens is a pretty popular lens, one because of its price point. It's usually between $300 and $450. The Samyang 135 is very similar. And there's a lot of accessories that are for it or out there for it, um, both for distributors and more private sales. Um, it's a prime focus camera lens. It has good low light exposure. Um, it's normally an F2 lens. Um, I tend to stop mine down two clicks down to 2.8, which takes its aperture from, I believe, around 68 down to 48 millimeters. I do that because of the star shape. Um, and if I have it wide open, the star shape tends to be pretty distorted. I don't like the results, and I'd rather image for a little longer at f2.8 while maintaining those stars. If you looked back, um, I'm running this on a Star Adventurer Pro. Um, I am guiding with it. You can put a guider, and I have a short 120 millimeter focal length 30 mil guide scope on it. Um, but I have an EAF on it, and I'll show you more of those. And I'm running that with an ASI Air Pro, and then I have a filter wheel that I'll attach back and forth. Um, but the most important thing is actually the rings to mount it, and I'll show you those next um, after this slide. But here's just a few examples of what I've been able to do with the 135 millimeter over the last six months or so, or actually it's about a year. So this is a spaghetti nebula. I had always seen this, but I never realized there was this huge hydrogen cloud up here until I started taking shots and trying to bring that nebulosity on top of the HOO of the spaghetti nebula. Here's the, the part and soul paired together. Um, and it just adds a really fun mixture to do that at the 135. Um, here's a picture of the Sagittarius star cloud, which is right here in the midst of the Milky Way. And here's um, M17, um, the Swan Nebula kind of tucked up here. And then here's Roa Fucus. So it offers you different perspectives on both faint targets and bright targets that have available out in the night sky. So here is my favorite one, though. This is one I did over the um, winter, um, probably early January, and just looked at on Stellarium. I was like, I, can I fit the rosette and can I fit the Christmas tree nebula? And I thought it'd be fun. I had no idea that there was nebulosity that extended like this, especially the square um, and all the different um, both hydrogen data, but also sulfur data that's rich in this kind of area. I had no idea. And even looking on Astrobin, there's very few representations of it, but it was a fun discovery. And I think it turned out as a neat project, not perfect, but just a neat project to work through. So as for mentioned, here are the rings. Um, I have the top pictured rings. So these are 3D plastic printed. Price points are in 80 to $95, um, but these um, have attachments and then they have inlaid um, receivers for bolts and nuts that allow you to attach both your guide scope up here on top for me, I use the ASI Air. I like the being able to run it off my phone. But here you can see that it's built for the electronic focuser from ZWO. So you're actually um, able to focus throughout the night and not lose focus. And I'll talk further about that. Here's a similar setup 
um, where the focuser is off to the side versus underneath if you were wanting to piggyback on a, a bigger scope. But for me, this is a great setup and really mobile. That might be a good que stopping point for questions. If anyone has basic questions on the 135, um, I have a few things we'll talk about focusing down. I have a question to start with. Um, you're using uh, filters on that. Uh, what kind of camera are you using for those? So I'm using um, either the ASI 294MC or MM Pro or the ASI 1600. Um, and and those are both um, uh, monochrome cameras? Two of them are monochrome, and then the MC is a one-shot color. OK. Uh, so, you're using narrow band filters then, so you've got a filter wheel in there, or how do you install your correct. filters? Yep. OK. Um, I have to go back a little bit. So here's a, a small, just five filter wheel there um, with one and a quarter inch filters, but I also have a larger filter wheel depending on what I'm using to take those pictures. Hmm. It seemed it seemed it would be difficult to um, fit everything in between. It actually works out really nicely because the filter wheel is the exact back focus you need to get the camera in focus. <laughs> yep, it is okay. perfect. It is bang on at 55 millimeters when I yeah. measure it out with my caliper. Um, so I can anything that's in that 20 millimeter width on that filter wheel works really well. And then the adapter, I use a Canon da adapter because that's what my base DSLR is in. Um, so it's a Canon adapted Rokinon 135 and it works perfect. Mm. Okay. But I will, uh, I, I'll talk a little bit more about cameras and sampling um, towards the end of the program. It might get Thank a little more into the weeds. So I didn't want to start in there quite yet. Thank you. So here's the, the Ascar um, 400. So like I said, I'm running this at a 280 millimeter focal length, um, but it can run at 400, um, which is the same focal length as my Rasa, just not with the same F ratio. Uh, my Rasa runs at F2 and the native runs at an F6 for the Ascar. Um, the Ascar is kind of a, a step up from Sharpstar's basic entry level um, telescopes with a little better optics. Um, I had talked to several people, including um, several that I mentioned earlier about what type of wide field refractors they liked. And I wanted to compare a few things like the Sharp Star is at 330, the Radian Raptor 275, the Red Cat at 250, seeing the Star 61. Um, the big selling port for me is I wanted a wider aperture. So the Ascar is actually a 72 millimeter objective. So I'm getting more light in. Um, and able to um, maximize that. And then at f3.9, I have a good focal ratio. The other thing is I'm running this on a pretty mid to low tier um, Celestron AVX mount that is not very heavy. So I literally can grab my tripod with the mount and the telescope um, fully loaded for an automated setup and plunk it outside, polar align it, and then I am starting imaging within that 15 to 20 minute window. Um, I'm also using a off-axis guider for the scope. One I had bought for my larger scope that never worked well for my large scope, um, but works really well um, at this focal length. And then I also have a, an electronic focuser and then another filter wheel. And then I'm running the ASI Air um, Plus here. And I'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then here's, oh, I'm, I haven't, I just, this scope has been on back order for six months, so I haven't captured too many um, images with them. Here's a combination of the, the spider nebula along with the tadpole and then the flaming star, both in HH or SHO and HAOO. Um, and I'm just really happy with the way the stars came out um, in both images, as well as like I told you earlier, it's the one shot color with HA layered in here on the seagull. Um, so it's performed really well. I'm really excited to use it during the Milky Way season and going forward as kind of that wide field refractor position. And I'll be pretty brief um, on the Rasa 8, but I still think it's still a wide, uh, short focal length um, telescope. Um, I did a presentation a year ago, so if you have questions, please see that. Um, but I tend to run it on the CGX mount, which is not as portable. The Rasa itself is not as portable. It's not grab and go. Um, it has a longer focal length guide camera, um, 
and then focusing is really important in the Rasa. Um, but here are some of the new images from this last year that I put together with that, um, especially using the new 294 mm with a smaller pixel size, um, able to get a lot of resolution out of that OTA. So if you have questions, let me know about any of those. And then here's just my, this is my favorite capture of the, the fall and winter, just the dolphin head. And even at 400 millimeter focal length, it still gives good perspective of all the dust and then the hydrogen nebulosity around the dolphin head while still maintaining good resolution um, and details throughout the, the DSO. So one of the things I mentioned in all three of those setups, I've been running the ASI Air Pro um, or Plus. Um, one, for me, I just entered a time where ZWO was producing a lot of cameras and I just started off on a CMOS versus a CCD. Um, so it was an easy thing to integrate my setups over the last three years with that, um, especially with both the Ascar and the 135. Um, I polar line with the ZWO. Literally, I set it out. I put it, put the mounts to their zero position towards Polaris, and then I um, polar line using plate solving from there, um, just with my phone in hand. Um, the other thing is the Z ASI Air Pro is doing the guiding, which is integrated. It's doing the image sequencing. It can even do multiple images through the night with the um, new updates on the ASI Plus. It's also controlling my camera cooling, the dew heaters, the autofocus, and it allows me to plate solve and go to previous image nights where I say, plate solve to the previous image that I took two nights ago or two weeks ago, and it'll automatically direct there. Um, so it just makes things simple and automated. Now, this isn't what I would start out with right out of the, the gate, but this is kind of a, a mid-tier setup for me. Um, and it's just easy because I can swap between different um, Raspberry Pi computers and just see what's going on. And especially with the new Plus, this antenna puts that range to about 60 yards from anywhere in my house that I can get access to it. So I've had really good luck with that, um, switching targets and changing things throughout the night. But there's a lot of other places. This is just kind of an overview why I've liked it, especially for the portable setup. It allows me to just, like I said, grab and go. Um, here shows the different polar alignment methods. On the left side with the, in the red is the QHY Pull master, which works well for my big mount. Um, I found it's a little more reliable. My guiding's better with it, whether that's mount or uh, polar alignment. But here's also the screen um, for the ASI Air. And it just shows you it plate solves, then it refreshes two or three seconds and plate solves again as you adjust the alt as and altitude, or sorry, alt azimuth. Um, and goes from there. And they get, especially at wide angle 135 and 280. It doesn't have to be precise. The guiding does just fine. One thing I did want to mention, and I hear you can see my old setup before I got the um, 3D printed rings. Um, it was unstable and it was okay, but the rings and adding the um, actual electronic focuser made a real difference. But with the Star Adventure, which is not a go-to mount, um, I can still use the ASI Air to get my framing exactly right from night to night. So once I polar aligned, I find a bright star and I have a, this laser that I just marked about where I want it. And then with the ZWO Air, I then plate solve that. And then I can adjust the mount um, both in the deck and the RA. So the RA down here, there's a couple buttons that you can push to move it back and forth once you're close. And then the deck, which is fixed, um, it's not controlled on this um, star tracker. You can actually move it left or right and it will swivel the deck until you get as accurate as you want to be on your plate solve. Um, and that just helps to not lose parts of your image and have it framed the same way night after night. Um, the other thing with this setup, I told you I was um, guiding. Um, I have noticed a big difference, especially taking those subs out to five or six minutes. And I do dither every five frames um, just in the RA um, using the air. And it just has brought clean data as I've gone through different projects. 
The other thing I just want to show you, I was using the same lower end electronic focuser um, in all three of these focal lengths. Um, so here on the back of the Rasa where the primary mirror is being moved, there's a bracket that attaches to the primary mover knob on the back. Um, here on the Asgar, it's going to a rack and pin focuser that's pretty standard. I just have it rotated so it clears the mount. Um, and then here on the um, 135, and I'll have a better picture later, the actual focuser is down in here and it has a cog system with these um, belts and it's basically driving the focus ring around and that allows you to maintain focus throughout the night. I'll show that here in a subsequent slide. Um, you can also see here I am running the same, um, I'm running my 135 on my Celestron mount instead of the Star Adventure. It's a little faster and a little cleaner and I can plate solve and go to. Um, so that meets my other criteria. I want to be able to jump each telescope OTA set up between mounts, depending on what else I was shooting that night. So here's a little better picture of the actual focuser and then the focus ring. So here's the focus ring and this belt just goes on outside of it and it has a cog wheel type system um, that it's using the focuser. Um, and this is important because as the temperature of the lens unit and the actual glass is cooling and the structures that are holding the glass, it changes your focus. And even though you're at wide focal length, that can actually really make a big difference on your stars. Um, I did run into an initial problem where I could not focus all the way. Or I would try to do my focus routine and I would get an error message. Um, my fix, because my focus point was pretty near to the infinity on the actual lens, was to just have the EAF focus in one direction. And it's worked great sense. Other people looking online have found that their actual infinity focus doesn't actually get the lens perfectly in focus for the stars and that you have to go and kind of modify the lens or that stop point at infinity. Nico Carver, who did a presentation, a good presentation a few weeks ago, um, has a link to this YouTube um, where he goes through how to remove that stop point on the Samyang or Rokinon so that you can actually get your lens to focus. We have a question over on YouTube. Okay. Uh, Hema wants to know if you have recommendations for uh, affordable narrowband or dual narrowband filters that work with the fast focal ratios of the sem the semiang lens, without making those uh, the, without bringing up the issues that come with with narrowband filters on fast lenses. Yeah. So, and this kind of goes back a little bit to the Rasa conversation I talked about last year is. If you're at 12 nanometers or even probably six nanometers, that band shift effect is within that margin. So as long as you, most of those lenses are going to do fine. So for me, I have astronomic filters um, that I that for the wide angle, I'm running two inch, 12 nanometers. So they're pretty broad filters for narrow band, um, and they work fine. But I've also run my six millimeter astronomic um, at one and a quarter filters that I use for my um, edge HD and I've run it on the 135 and I haven't had any issues. Um, some of the pictures I've already shown um, have both of those and they have good signal throughout the entire image. So those are on the cheaper side without going to the um, band shifted. You really only need band shifted if I understand it in less than five nanometers, but I could be incorrect. I know Terry is well versed in that area. Brandon, I have another question. So yes. what is your arc seconds per pixel? I have a full two? table for you, Eric, coming up. OK, so I guess my question is really getting to, do you really need to guide with something like the 135? Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll show you the difference um, here in a couple different. Um, and it's mainly for the longer focal length, especially if you're, or, sorry, sub exposure. So if I'm at five, six minutes, um, I've noticed a difference in the star quality. Um, and I'll show you, it, it's only at very high um, pixel scale that it matters. Uh, but here is an image that I took um, last year of Roa Fucus that I showed earlier. And it's not a bad image, but this is where I went out and manually focused the Rokinon. And I basically used the zoom 
feature within the ASI Air Pro and found a star and tried to get that star as small as possible and showed the graphs as small as possible. And I did the um, project over several nights and it's not terrible, but as I zoom in, so especially on this top right, you can see this small cluster and these stars are starting to get really um, towards the edge of the field. They're really having some um, issues with them, both guiding and probably a little, little bit of um, coma that's occurring. Probably didn't have the lens stop down when I thought I did have it stop down to 2.8. Versus if you look in more of the center part of the object coming here by these two clusters, these stars are nicely in focused and pinpoint. Um, so it, part of it, I probably dumped half my subs though, because these stars started to look really poor through the night um, based on the, the focusing not so much um, the pixel scale and the guiding. Um, and uh, Brandon, I think the technical term for that is wonky. <laughs> I, I think there's a lot of languages and words for that, but yes, it, it can definitely happen. Um, so here's a picture of the heart and soul that I showed earlier. Um, and this is one I actually did with uh, the 294 at the one by one binning. So the pixel size is at 2.3 microns. And so here is a 135 of the Sol Nebula, which I have much higher exposure focal lengths of this, but I, I think the detail for 135 millimeter is really good. And the stars are nice and round with five minute exposures or four minute exposures, I can't remember. Um, and here's the heart of the heart. Um, so you see them a lot 15, um, but I'm still getting detail um within that especially within these um, gas pillars here um, as well as in this cluster and so i think at the end of the day i've noticed an improvement compared to um, what i had done before with the roa fucus project and here i'm getting to that idea of what is sampling and what is seen um, so this picture over here um, i took this from my uh, one shot color 294 MC. So this is at a pixel scale um, with, and this was shot with my Rasa. This pixel scales, I believe around 2.4 um, arc seconds per pixel, um, but it's definitely under sampled. You see very blocky stars. You start to see these cross formations. If you look at here, this middle picture is taken with the 294, but it's on the unbend. So instead of 2.4, it's around 1.2 arc seconds per pixel. And you can really see when you compare these two squares on the image, there are four different squares here of different colored gray versus one block here. And you notice the stars are well sampled um, or ideally sampled. This picture on the left, so I couldn't get the same star picture. This is uh, luminance data with my edge nine and a quarter. So it's at about 0.6 arc seconds per pixel, which is about half um, or so it's half the size compared to the, or sorry, this is half the size compared to this, but you can see it's very oversampled and you get these very, very white. And then this gradation looks really poor. Um, so part of the thing with wide angle photography is you really want to narrow or nail down the um, sampling um, to get the best star quality as well as getting the best signal to noise ratio um, with these wide, scapes that have lots of different details, star clusters, and different nebulosity throughout. So with that in mind, um, I want to show you my cameras that I'm using and how they compare and what I'm doing. And then we'll kind of go to some of the more popular ZWO cameras, what they look like, what they're doing, and what their pixel scale is. So here's here's the MC that I talked about. At its at the Rasa, it's 2.4, but you go to 280 millimeters, it's 3.4. And then you go to the Rokinon and you're at seven. So this goes back to Eric's point earlier. Why are you guiding if your arc seconds per pixel is four times what your guiding is? It's not changing anything. Um, but here, if you look at the 294 when it's in the unbend, so you're looking at a pixel size of 2.3, um, your arc seconds per pixel are actually ideally sampled for the Rasa. Um, and they're still pretty good um, for the, the Ascar, you're starting to definitely notice a fall off point here. Um, now that one by one pixel comes with the downside. It, you go from a 14 bit camera down to a 12 point, and then you also go from 
an 11 megapixel to 47 megapixel and your file sizes start to jump quite substantially on your fit files. Um, but if you look at that, that's you're getting twice the resolution or if you're comparing it to the 1600, which has the very classic pixel size of 3.76. This is the same pixel size that's in the new 2600 mm and the 6200 mm, as well as the new 533. That's all of these pixel sizes. So you can actually see what your arc seconds per pixel are at each of these focal lengths. And then how is that going to fit your scene conditions? So for me, like I said, um, I sit between at my best nights, two and a half, um, even some nights down to 2.1, 2.2, but most of my nights are between three and four with some bad nights at 4.5 for my scene. So if I'm looking at what's ideally, what's ideal sampling, if I had excellent scene, you can definitely push it. But for me, I'm having average scene to borderline poor. So I'm looking at this pixel scale, what's ideally sampled. And so I, if I'm within two times that limit on that upper limit, I'm going to get good results. If I'm more than two times beyond that, my results are going to be blurry and soft, and I'm not going to have as good of an end product. Uh, but that's just to kind of give perspective on which cameras I'm using. Um, this next slide shows just a comparison of different pixel sizes um, and then what your sensor diagonals are, um, as well as what your megapixels are. Now, there's a lot that can be said about these cameras, and I don't intend to talk about everything on each one. Um, but I know I was asked last presentation about the 183. It has a nice pixel size um, at 2.4. So you can get a lot of resolution. But its diagonal is only 16 millimeters. And that's also the same size as the new 533. So you're just giving up a fair amount of sensor size to get that pixel size versus the 294 um, over here is at 23. And if you go up to the APSC, you're at 28. And then your full frame, you're at 43. So they're, they're give and takes with those, um, but I think it's important. The other thing I want to point out is that at 2.3 um, microns on here, that's obviously you've doubled the resolution of your telescope. So if I'm taking something with a, a 4.6 pixel size and then I take it down to 2.3, that's like going from a focal length of 400 on my Rasa to maybe a 800 uh, focal length refractor while maintaining that same um, resolution. So you can actually take much deeper images with those smaller pixels at those shorter focal lengths and kind of make up for what you're lacking on your actual focal length. Now that's not perfect and you can definitely do a lot of things with higher focal length instruments, but it gives you an opportunity to really bring out some details um, and some different nebulosity and galaxies. Speaking of galaxies, I wanted to show just the improvement, what that sampling does um, by changing the pixel size. So this is um, NGC 604. It is right down here in M33 Triangulum Galaxy. So this nebula is about 100 times wider than the Orion Nebula. Um, here was my initial data, which is from this picture a year ago. It's a one-shot color with the MC294. Um, and then I've added hydrogen alpha layer that's into it. If you look here, all I did to that image was add luminance layers. I think they were three minutes luminance layers on my Rasa 8. Um, with the 294 mm, but I had it at the small pixel size. You can see drastically that there's a huge resolution bump. So you have a 2x resolution bump here, and you're actually starting to resolve star clusters over here. And actually, if you look at the image, you're resolving individual stars. Um, so here's Hubble's comparison, and I've then circled the individual stars that are being resolved. Now, they're not perfect. And, resolved is a very questionable and soft comment here. But I think it's pretty incredible that I'm taking a 400 millimeter focal length instrument and I have enough resolution with the camera to actually resolve a nebula or a nebula in a galaxy 3 million light years away with that equipment. And for me, that makes the hobby that much more fun and allows me to have different targets and seeing what I can pull out. 
Now I don't routinely recommend comparing to Hubble. I probably won't compare to Hubble for a long time. I'll let these guys who have much longer focal length and better seeing do that. Um, but here is just the, the picture of the galaxy and the detail that I was able to get just from my backyard in Bortle 4. And it's something I'm proud of and it makes the hobby fun and I want to keep coming back to it and improving and getting better. So that's it for my presentation. Um, I know I kind of did a topical whirlwind kind of 30,000 foot view, uh, but I wanted to do a presentation that was open to beginners that were transitioning from beginning to intermediate um, astrophotography and what it looks like to go from using a batten off mask and unguided to guiding and doing electronic focusers, um, but at a, a more forgiving focal length. So I hope that was helpful and I'm definitely open to further questions. Brandon, hey, Brandon. it looks like you have a couple budding astronomers. I do. The, the boys and their younger sister are out and about with us quite a bit. So we, we love the time and anything we can get outside, we enjoy it. Hey, Brandon, I have a question about focusing uh, with your SCT, your ESA. Yeah. Um, how do you, is that electronic or do you do that manually? Uh, that's electronic. Um, it's still moving that primary mirror. Um, so it's not perfect but it's a lot better than manually moving it. Okay, yeah, that's, that's curious. So, so the primary does work, uh, move up and down that on that yeah, on the no, resin. Like, yeah, but it's not a fixed point. It's not like a Crayford. Okay. You on the SCT. Thank you. Uh, your narrow band images, your Hubble pellets, are they tone mapped or are they? Um, a couple of them are. Um, so if I pull out a, um, so this one is tone mapped. Um, I've definitely also done the monkey head nebula that I've tone mapped. Um, and I think I used a little bit on the uh, spaghetti nebula to bring out this hydrogen cloud above the spaghetti nebula. Um, so I kind of play with the data and see what it yields. And sometimes I really like um, tone mapping. Um, so I, I don't think I put it in this presentation, but I, I really, use tone mapping to bring out the beard portion of the monkey head nebula when I shot it with the Rasa this last um, season. And how do you add your hydrogen alpha data to your RGB? Um, so usually what I do is I um, add the luminance layer to my RGB first, um, and then I go in and use the script within PixInsight, and then I adjust it um, in the nonlinear state. I don't see any other questions over on YouTube. Anybody else uh, in the room have a question? Alex? Okay, no, I think we're okay. I think we've got everything here. Um, uh, I think what I'm gonna do is, um, as much as I love uh, clutching together things, um, I might consider the electronic focuser um, and some other things to make make my little portable rig with the Sammy a little easier. So I picked that up tonight and a few other things. So I really appreciate it. And I really like your approach of, um, you know, we need all sorts of presentations on the Astro Imaging channel. Uh, yeah, we need, you know, really advanced, like next week we'll have this fancy um, mosaic that Jose is going to tell us about and how he puts it all together. But there's an awful lot of people out there that want to know some real basic stuff and uh, really appreciate Brandon offering to volunteer to come in and, and show us some of that stuff. So thank you very much, Brandon, for being here tonight. You're welcome. And, uh, okay. and Alex, if you can't fill spots going forward, um, maybe I'll process a wide field image after we get through the Milky Way season. Um, just yeah. for the basic process. Appreciate it. It's appreciate it. Different. Um taste to get those right versus some of those deeper um, objects for sure. Okay. That's about it for tonight then. We'll see you next week with the big mosaic and um, uh, oh yeah, Brandon, could you stop sharing? I don't know if you did or not. Anyway, um, we'll see you next week and we're ready to check out. So who's, who's streaming? Molly, you in charge? Yep, I got it. Okay, take us out, Molly. Thank you. And no. thanks for Thanks, everybody, for fixing the streaming problem we had at the very beginning. 
Yep. Good night, everyone. Bet everyone stick around. <laughs> Bye.